I'm Dr. Mark Hyman. I'm the director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine. I'm really excited to have Dr. Suzanne Go here. She's an extraordinary uh, physician, researcher, and has really explored the world of autism in a unique way, looking at it from a system perspective uh, and through the lens of not just uh, behavioral pediatrics, but through the lens of more of a comprehensive view, looking at all the aspects that affect autism, including biochemistry, uh, neurophysiology, uh, communication, family systems, uh, and, and many, many other inputs. And her talk today is going to be on mitochondria, music, and autism, which really is a kind of a unique view of how to access the autistic brain. She's a board-certified neurologist, pediatric behavioral neurologist, and neuroscientist, a researcher, author. She was born here in Ohio, in Toledo. She uh, went to Harvard undergraduate, uh, Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, Harvard Medical School, in, and then um, did her PEDS internship at Mass General and her pediatric neurology residency at UCSF. Um, her research really focuses on autism as a metabolic disease, and, uh, and it's very different than our current approaches, and uses brain imaging to identify differences in brain circuits in autism. So um, she's really focused on researching and developing theories for neurological conditions and the impact in childhood brain development. She's published widely in many journals, including Pediatric Neurology, Annals of Neurology, JAMA Psychiatry, which I read last night, Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience, and, and more. Um, she's served as the Associate Research Scientist and Assistant Professor of Clinical Neurology and the Division of Child Psychiatry at Columbia University, and she's the former co-director of the Columbia University Developmental Neuropsychiatry Program for Autism and Related Disorders. So she also wrote an extraordinary book called Spectacular Bond, uh, Reaching a Child with Autism. And found, she's the founder and chief medical officer of Cortica and the creator of the Cortica Care Model. So thank you, Dr. Go, for coming to Cleveland, and welcome. Love to hear from you. So, as you see from the title of today's talk, we're going to be talking about a very broad range of topics, uh, from mitochondrial dysfunction and autism to music therapy for autism and many other related topics. Um, I wonder if I could just get a quick show of hands of how many of you are medical practitioners? Great. And how many in a, a non-medical field? Okay. Great. So... These are our learning objectives for today, to define the causative factors for autism, to recognize neurophysiological and metabolic disturbances to brain development in autism, to describe a range of therapeutic approaches, physiological and behavioral, that have a role in autism treatment, and to cite recent research findings that impact treatment for autism. And in navigating these topics, we'll look at early theories, current understanding, and future directions. I have two disclosures. So one is that I'm co-founder and chief medical officer of Cortica, which is a multidisciplinary uh, care center for the comprehensive treatment of autism. Uh, we're located in San Diego and opening a clinic in Irvine next month. And I'm co-founder and chief medical officer of Mito Medical, which is uh, a nutritional supplement company that focuses on mitochondrial therapies. So what is autism? Yeah. Can you just pause? Oh, sure. Yeah, it's some technical difficulties. Oh, okay. is not. Okay. Uh, working for the video. <laughs> it's not picking up your audio. Oh, okay. It's okay. Well, you're fine, your That's okay. You can go ahead. <laughs> okay. The first description of autism in the medical literature was in 1943 by Leo Connor, who was a child psychiatrist and the founding chief of the first child psychiatry department in the U.S., which was at Johns Hopkins University. And uh, in this case series called Autistic Disturbances of Affective Contact, he and um, many parents provide a very rich description of autism in a group of children of varying ages. And I wanted to show you this video of a young child with autism this is the girl that we feature in the book Spectacular Bond, Reaching the Child with Autism, which I co-wrote with the developmental psychologist Marion Blank and Susan DeLand, who's the mother of this girl. Um, and you'll hear Susan speaking in the video. Um, what strikes, what I find striking about this video is that it, it exemplifies many of the features that were uh, described in Connor's first publication. Some of the parents reported their children acting as though in a shell and as though other people weren't there. So I'll show you this video. Hey, 
In thinking about how our understanding of autism has changed over the years, um, I recommend you to you this really fascinating book, which was co-written by a historian, Rab Houston, and a neuroscientist, Uta Frith. They describe uh, the symptoms of uh, a gentleman from 18th century Scotland whose life was documented in legal archives. And it's fascinating to think about how his differences were understood and described by those around him and then how autism manifests in our world today. In the 1960s, there emerged several theories about the causes of autism. And one is, is uh, shown here in this book on the left uh, by Bruno Bettelheim, who was a psychoanalyst. Um, and he put forth the theory that autism was caused by um, mothers who showed emotional frigidity to their children, or what he called refrigerator mothers. Um, this documentary shown here on the right, Refrigerator Mothers, was released by PBS in 2002 and gave a voice to mothers who were able to describe their experience of self-doubt and guilt um, as a consequence of this theory, which had a foothold in the medical community. Now, also in the 1960s, um, research was being done um, by this a psychologist shown here, uh, Dr. Uh, Lovas, who was a psychologist and professor at UCLA. Um, these are images taken from a Life magazine publication, a magazine article in 1965, describing some of the techniques that were used. Now, these images are hard to look at, and even the title is, I think, hard, to, hard for us, uh, given our lens, to see. But I think it's important that we recognize um, all the different aspects of the history of our field. And I think, too, it's important to say that um, Dr. Lobos's work was some of the earliest work to suggest that autism was something other than a static encephalopathy, that it could be changed, and that children's symptoms could improve. And that was also a very important um, milestone in the history of our field. Now, applied behavior analysis, um, which is the technique um, that Dr. Lobos developed, comes out of the field of psychology called behaviorism. And behaviorism very specifically limits its purview to observable behavior. And that was because at the time, uh, very little was known about, quote, unobservable activity, such as that that was happening in the brain. So in a sense, it was very appropriate to be not speculating about what was happening in the brain because very little was known. But since the 1960s, behaviorism has been largely replaced by cognitive psychology and neuroscience. Um, but ABA still has a very important and prominent role in autism treatment, and we'll talk a little bit more about, um, about uh, ABA and how it's practiced today. Now, even though autism was described in uh, 1943 in the medical literature, it didn't appear in the DSM until 1980. And the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, published by the American Psychiatric Association. And the formal definition of autism has undergone several revisions. The most recent um, edition of the DSM, DSM-5, defines autism according to these five diagnostic criteria. Persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction across multiple contexts. Restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. Onset in the early developmental period. Clinically significant impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of current functioning and not better explained by intellectual disability or global developmental delay. Now, also, another very interesting aspect of the history of autism is that this book by Bernard Rimland, uh, in which he proposed a physiological, neurological theory of autism, was actually published in 1964, so three years prior to Bettelheim's book, but in many ways was overshadowed. And so it raises the question of what gives power and influence to certain ideas in medicine, and what does that tell us about how certain social or cultural forces may shape the way that we practice medicine. So given all of that background, um, I wanted to share with you this image, uh, which is sometimes referred to as 
the duck rabbit uh, optical illusion. It was made famous by the philosopher Wittgenstein to show that the same information can be in viewed in entirely different ways. And this image was also used by the philosopher of science, uh, Thomas Kuhn, in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, in which he introduced the concept of a paradigm shift. And the idea that scientific fields undergo periodic shifts in which new ways of understanding are possible that were not possible according to previous explanatory models. So, let's... What was the image? <laughs> well, it's like a bird, but I can't tell. Like Can you see the rabbit? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's think about now our current understanding of what autism is and, and what causes autism. Um, I want to refer you to... Um, a really useful website, which is uh, the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee's website. Um, they're part of the Department of Health and Human Services. And they provide a regularly updated and very thorough review of research literature on the causes of autism. And so what we know now, or what we believe now, is that there are many different routes with both genetic and environmental contributions that can lead to the symptoms of autism. And how many different genes seem to increase risk for autism, the number is estimated to be close to 1,000, which is nearly 5% of the human genome. And not surprisingly, many of those genes and gene loci are involved in uh, aspects of brain development, like neuronal migration, synapse function, and synapse formation. But it's clear that there are mechanisms beyond genetic variants, whether inherited or spontaneous genetic variants, there are mechanisms beyond those that are necessary for understanding the complex causes of autism and there are clear environmental contributions. So early studies suggest increased risk for autism associated with prenatal maternal infection, prematurity, advanced maternal and paternal age, short interpregnancy interval, certain air pollutants, and endocrine disrupting chemicals including organophosphates and phthalates. And that there's a protective effect from maternal intake of prenatal vitamins prior to and in the first trimester of pregnancy. And the body of, of research literature um, showing developmental toxicity of certain uh, environmental chemicals is growing. And this is a review paper that was published in Lancet Neurology a few years ago. Um, and in it, the authors review the research literature demonstrating 11 different industrial chemicals and pesticides that have toxicity to the developing brain. And they write, neurodevelopmental disabilities including autism, ADHD, dyslexia, and other cognitive impairments affect millions of children worldwide, and some diagnoses seem to be increasing in frequency. Industrial chemicals that injure the developing brain are among the known causes for this prevalence. To control the pandemic of developmental neurotoxicity, we propose that untested chemicals should not be presumed to be safe to brain development, and chemicals in existing use and all new chemicals be tested for developmental neurotoxicity. I think what's surprising is that this isn't already the case and that the call to action is simply that the chemicals be tested um, for developmental neurotoxicity. Now let's shift uh, our focus now to look at the, what is known about the neurophysiological and metabolic disturbances in autism. So neurophysiology is a broad term used to refer to the electrical and the electrochemical activity of the nervous system. And there are many ways in which neurophysiology has been, show, has been demonstrated to be disrupted in autism. So one is um, an impairment in synaptic pruning with an overabundance of synapses and cells in the brain, especially in the first years of life. Another is an excess of local connections and a relative impairment of long-range connectivity. Another is uh, an increased ratio of excitatory to inhibitory neurotransmission, and also signs of neuroinflammation with microglial activation. And one of the most striking clinical manifestations of the disturbance to neurophysiology in autism is the high rate of seizures. How common are seizures in autism? Well, the prevalence of epilepsy in the typically developing population is one to 2%, and in those with autism, 
is estimated in research studies to be between 20 to 50 percent, depending on the population, the specific population that's studied. And the prevalence of an abnormal EEG in the typically developing population is between 2 to 5 percent, and in those with autism has been estimated to be as high as 80 percent. So clear disturbance in the, neuro, in the neurophysiology of, of the brain in children with autism. Um, many different seizure types are known to occur in autism, both generalized and focal, and seizures may appear only as brief alterations of awareness and attention or subtle interruptions to ongoing behavior. And I'd like to show you a few examples of seizure types that are known to occur in autism. And this first is a type of seizure called generalized tonic-clonic seizure. So generalized tonic clonic seizure tends to be the type that we think of. It's the most um, apparent uh, loss of consciousness and shaking movements of the entire body. Here's a seizure type that's more subtle. This is an absence seizure. So you can see there are a few seconds where the child stared off and had some, some blinking um, and some movements of the mouth. Could very easily be missed. This is an example of a child who is having myoclonic seizures. Chase, you are right, buddy? And this is an example of a child who's having a complex partial seizure. You with mommy? Hi. What do you do? You've just been running around and then all of a sudden you had one of your episodes again. How are you feeling? How are you feeling? So you can see there that um, awareness is partially altered, um, and there are also some movements that we call automatism, so some chewing movements of the mouth um, and some, some movements of the hands and fingers. A very important question in our field has been, in children with autism and epilepsy, could treatment for epilepsy lead to improvement in the symptoms of autism? And for a very long time, the answer was thought to be no. Um, but based on more recent research, um, the, the, the feeling now in the field is that uh, for many children with autism and epilepsy, treatment of the epilepsy may help with, to improve the cognitive and behavioral symptoms of autism, and in some cases, um, potentially reverse uh, the symptoms as well. Now, in thinking about the metabolic disturbances to the brain and autism, there's, it's a really vast, vast territory. And the part that I'd like to focus on um, and which has uh, a large body of research evidence to support it now, is mitochondrial dysfunction. And these are just some of the research studies that have been published in recent years demonstrating mitochondrial dysfunction in individuals with autism. And most of these are either post-mortem studies or studies of peripheral <laughs> tissues. Uh, this was a very important study published in JAMA in 2010 in which researchers at UC Davis demonstrated that children with autism had multiple biochemical markers of mitochondrial dysfunction, including reduced function of a portion of the respiratory chain, uh, complex one. And this was a research paper, a brain imaging study that we did at Columbia University and published in 2015, in which we looked uh, directly in brain tissue using MR spectroscopy to look for evidence of mitochondrial dysfunction in a large sample of children and adults with autism um, compared to typically developing controls. And this image here in the middle, multiplanar chemical shift imaging, uh, shows the technique that we used. 
So we looked at each cubic centimeter voxel of brain tissue, and in a single brain, there are approximately 1,200 to 1,400 cubic centimeters of tissue. We looked at each voxel to, to see if we could detect an elevation of lactate, which is a biomarker of mitochondrial dysfunction. And I just want to contrast that technique with a technique that had been used in two prior studies. Now, the conclusion of the earlier studies was that there was no evidence for brain mitochondrial dysfunction in autism. But the technique that was used in those studies was this one here shown in the lower right corner. And the red and the green uh, bars here show you essentially large slabs of brain tissue through which signal was averaged. And there were large territories of brain that were left unexamined. So using a more high-resolution technique, we were able to show that, indeed, there was a statistically significant higher rate of lactate elevation in those with autism. Uh, it was detected in 13% of the autism group and 1% of controls. We think that is likely to be an underestimate because of limitations of the technology. Um, this diagram here shows an example of a spectra from one of our autism participants. The spectra corresponds to the voxel in the basal ganglia, shown in the red square. And off to the right, you can see the peak that corresponds to the detection of lactate elevation. What we have here are composite maps. So we took uh, the, the findings from the entire autism group, and these boxes show you the areas of the brain in which lactate was, elevation was detected across the entire group. Um, the most common location is shown in red, and then yellow, and then blue. And uh, lactate was detected most commonly in this area shown here, uh, highlighted in red, which is the cingulate gyrus. And the cingulate gyrus is a very important part of the brain that functions in the integration and regulation of higher order cognitive processes, mood, and behavior. So we think what we've identified is both a mechanism and a brain region that may underlie the symptoms of autism in a subset of, of individuals. Um, I won't take time now to talk about mitochondrial approaches and therapies, but would be happy to answer questions about that. I'd like to move on to look um, a little bit more broadly at different therapeutic approaches that have a role in autism <clears throat> treatment. So I think all of you understand quite well the need to create new models and new frameworks when developing new approaches to the practice of medicine. And that's what this represents. So this is a very simple framework that we use in our clinic simply to show that there are many different domains um, that are worth addressing as part of a comprehensive treatment program for autism. And we talked a little bit about neurophysiology and biochemistry, and I'd like to turn now to think about sensory motor integration, communication, cognition, and behavior. Now, um, therapies to address child development in these domains have historically not had a lot to do with neuroscience. Um, and my feeling is that the research literature has progressed to a, to a stage now where um, that's possible and it can lead us to some, in some very exciting directions. This image, um, it's a little bit hard to see, but that's okay. So this image shows essentially the explosion of brain imaging studies of autism over the past 30 years with three research papers published in 1984 and a steady increase and 327 papers published in 2016 alone. So a lot is known about autism from brain imaging studies. And this slide just shows some of the techniques, structural and functional imaging techniques that have been applied to the study of autism. And this was a review paper that I published with uh, Brad Peterson, who at the time was the chief of child psychiatry at Columbia. We reviewed all of the brain imaging studies that had been done in autism up to that point. And what we found was evidence for disturbances to multiple learning and memory systems, including declarative memory for facts and events, which relies heavily on structures in the medial temporal lobe, disturbances to procedural learning and memory systems for skills and habits, which relies heavily on the striatum and striatal networks, and other learning and memory systems that rely on the cortex, amygdala, and cerebellum. And what's believed now is that this widespread disturbance is one of connectivity, and that there is impaired long-range structural and functional connectivity in autism with reduced long-range connections, but excessive local connectivity, and that this disturbance happens early in development 
and that it impacts function across social, language, cognitive, motor, and sensory domains. So what's emerging is a view of autism that is not solely a social and communicative disorder, but one in which cognitive, motor, and sensory systems are also impacted and also um, uh, should be targets of therapy. What does the new understanding of the disturbances to neural networks in autism mean for treatment? Well, I would propose that the goal of treatment should be to aim to build neural networks that underlie flexible and coordinated functioning across social language, cognitive, sensory, and motor domains. But conventional therapeutic approaches often attempt to address these functions in isolation. But we know that these neural networks don't act in isolation or develop in isolation. For example, communication, which is the receiving and delivering of messages, requires sensory perception and integration. Communication also requires motor control. So to deliver a message requires motor control, initiating, sustaining, or inhibiting movement. So I challenge you to try to communicate with another person, either without sensory perception or without motor control. It's not possible. So communication is inherently a sensory motor ability. This is a quote um, by, from a book by the Pulitzer Prize winning biologist E.O. Wilson. He was a professor at Harvard at the time that I was an undergraduate there studying the history of medicine. He writes, the ongoing fragmentation of knowledge and resulting chaos are not reflections of the real world, but artifacts of scholarship. The way that we approach treatment for autism and treatment of many other chronic conditions, I feel is more a reflection of scholarship um, and not a reflection of the human brain or human physiology. Now, there are several emerging techniques for what I call multimodal therapy in autism, which cross disciplinary boundaries. And one of them is music therapy with a specific neurodevelopmental approach. It involves the therapeutic application of the tools of music to cognitive, sensory, and motor dysfunction due to disorders of the nervous system and is increasingly being applied to autism. So some examples of what this approach to music therapy targets are psychomotor regulation or cognitive control over movement, sensory motor integration, for example, employing a rhythmic framework that promotes predictability and tolerability for incoming auditory, visual, tactile, proprioceptive, and vestibular information, arousal, using music to modulate a child's level of arousal, executive function, so using the tools of music to develop skills for initiation, inhibition, sustaining, and switching task, and working memory, targeting working memory through music making. These are just some examples of um, how music therapy can be applied to neurodevelopmental disorders. And this is a review article that was published um, by one of the music therapists in my center, Michelle Hardy, who's been very active in leading um, and developing new practices to apply music therapy to the treatment of autism. Um, she's a collaborator with a professor at Colorado State University, Blythe Lagasse. And in this review article, they discuss the use of rhythm um, as a means for habilitation across a very wide range of sensory motor cognitive and communication goals in autism. Another emerging technique for multimodal therapy in autism um, has to do with the use of writing and typing. So a lot of research now demonstrates that there's an auditory processing impairment in many individuals with autism, but enhanced visual processing. And this manifests, one of the ways that this manifests is as hyperlexia, or the precocious ability to read before two years of age, which is associated with autism. Temple Grandin uh, named her book Thinking in Pictures, describing the phenomenon of the enhanced visual processing capability that she experiences. And so in therapies, we see the emergence of an increased use of reading, writing, and typing to foster speech language development, particularly in those children who are nonverbal or minimally verbal. Um, and language is presented not just spoken, but also written. And this is a research uh, study that we published in the International Journal of Developmental Disabilities in 2013, where we looked at um, a group of non-speaking, nonverbal uh, children with autistic disorder, ages 5 to 13, 
and we enrolled them in a nine-month trial of a reading and writing program, and were able to demonstrate that children could learn to read and write with comprehension even in the absence of spoken language. So enhanced visual processing in autism means that written language can and should be used to help build a complete language system. And to demonstrate for you um, what it can be like to have difficulty with auditory processing and then to be helped by uh, some visual processing supports, I wanted to share with you this um, clip from Carpool Karaoke. And um, I'll, I'll let you see. But I do not know what you're saying. Because I've been acting like sour milk on the floor. It's your fault you didn't shut the refrigerator. Maybe that's the reason I've been acting so cold. Okay, so <laughs> don't tell me true. Because I've, I've, like, like, so I've been acting like I've been acting like sour, sour milk, milk all, all on the floor. It's your fault you, you didn't, didn't shut, shut the refrigerator. So maybe that's, that's the why reason I've been acting so cold. Because I've been acting like sour milk. I don't know how that exercise was for you, but that certainly exceeded my auditory processing capability. <laughs> and what, what strategies would help you with that task? A visual prompt. Rewind. <laughs> so maybe given the chance to, to read and study this, it would make the auditory processing task easier. So um, I want to draw your attention to these words highlighted in green here. These words fall into a category of words that we call non-content words. Non-content words take much of their meaning from the words around them, so the context, the sentences, and the paragraphs that they're in. Um, non-content words make up the majority of words that we see on any written page and the majority of words that we hear spoken around us. In the past, speech-language therapy for children with autism has attempted to simplify their approach by removing these words. And so in, in therapies, you might hear things like touch boy or touch sitting, meaning you know, identify the boy that is sitting or identify the, the, the figure that's sitting. But by removing these words, we've unintentionally made it more difficult for children to ultimately learn them. And so one of the things that we do in our, in our clinic is that we have programs which teach non-content words right from the very beginning. And um, we found that that to be a, a very useful approach. Um, and then the words here highlighted in red are the words that uh, children with autism more often do remember, in part because they have a more concrete meaning, and in part because they come at the end of the phrase or the sentence. And so the working memory demand is less. Now, um, I would propose that even though the way that many of the, the therapists um, who treat autism are trained, which is largely in sort of silos of academic scholarship, that there's a real need now for integration, collaboration, a common understanding of autism, um, and that these domains don't map neatly to a single specialty or a single type of intervention. That in fact, therapists across um, all of these different specialties um, are working across domains and um, that multimodal therapies have an important role in the future of autism treatment. Now to bring a lot of this together, I wanted to share with you a case. And I selected the case of a young man from our clinic, um, in part to illustrate some of the changes that are possible in young adults. Um, we hear so much about uh, changes that can occur in very young children, but uh, changes in adolescents and adults are also, um, are also very possible. So this is a 19-year-old man with autism. Uh, he was diagnosed with PDD-NOS, which is Pervasive Developmental Disorder, NOS, 
at age two. That diagnosis is no longer in, in the DSM. But at the time, it was a diagnosis given to children with autism who were felt to be more mild. And over the years, his parents reported minimal progress in therapies. Uh, they had, this was a family that had a lot of resources, and he had a, access to a lot of uh, good quality therapies, but he didn't seem to make good progress, and he even had periods of regression. And he developed a high level of rigid repetitive behaviors and had rare spontaneous language. Prior to them coming to our clinic, he'd had a three-month escalation in agitation, aggression, self-injury, and destructive behavior. And those included grabbing and hitting his mother, throwing objects, destroying walls and furniture, and inappropriate public behavior, namely a public masturbation. What is the conventional treatment approach for an adult with autism who has aggressive, self-injurious, and destructive behaviors? Antipsychotics. Antipsychotics, yeah. So uh, medications. Any other? Restraining. Restraint. Restraint, yeah. So very often a, what you might consider a strict behavioral approach where restraint may be used um, and often residential living. So um, these types of behaviors make it difficult for a child or an adult to stay in the home environment. Any other thoughts about that? Dr. Manos, any, any thoughts? Okay. Okay, yeah. Um, and indeed, we, you know, in our center, we do work with quite a, a few young adults with autism who come to us on a, an array of antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, anti-anxiety medications, antidepressants, anti-epileptics, and um, with a range of side effects from those. And we, we work to try to, to reduce the number of medications they're on. So for this young man, we proceeded with a, a range of tests, a chromosomal microarray analysis, which is a, now considered a first-line genetic test for all those with autism, but many adolescents and, and adults um, with autism haven't seen a physician in quite some time, and many have not had these tests done. Um, the microarray analysis looks in very high resolution at regions of chromosome to see if there are duplications or deletions. And the yield is estimated to be about 10 to 15 percent um, for a finding in an individual with autism. Uh, we also proceeded with a gene sequencing panel for genes, gene mutations um, that are known to be involved in develop, brain development. And we also proceeded with a 24-hour ambulatory EEG. For him, those tests came back normal, so there were no treatment implications from those. But from his blood and urine testing for metabolic uh, disturbances and nutritional deficiencies, there were some findings. And in fact, um, I, I didn't include all the details here, but for him, one of the most useful tests that we did was for food sensitivity and allergy testing. And the reason that that ended up being so useful was that it prompted a pretty dramatic change in his diet. So uh, his parents implemented with high fidelity a four-day rotation diet with elimination of certain foods, including uh, gluten and dairy, dairy foods. And um, the adherence to that was very strong, and we saw um, benefits from that. But most of his nutritional uh, supplementation plan was guided less by test results and more by symptom, by targeting symptoms. And his level of anxiety and repetitive behaviors or obsessive compulsive tendencies was so high that we really selected supplements to target those. Um, so he was started on 5-HTP. Um, he started on a blend, a mixture of GABA, glycine, and L-theanine, low-dose naltrexone, and N-acetylcysteine. And also as part of his treatment program, we did quite intensive modification to the home environment and parent training, um, changes to the environment and to the interpersonal interaction with his parents that helped to avoid sensory overload. Um, he also started a program of occupational therapy, speech language therapy, music therapy, ABA, typing for communication, and neurofeedback. And in the past two years, so he's now 21 years old, there have been some important achievements. He was able to attend his sibling's wedding. Uh, he's been able to travel across the country with his parents. He's had musical experiences, including piano lessons and learning to play the guitar. Uh, he's been involved in athletics, uh, including tennis, and he's also become quite an avid runner. So every morning he runs three to five miles. 
and he's had um, meaningful communication through typing with his family and therapists. And this is an email that his, his parents sent to us. M is revealing a completely different person that lives inside his mind, one with a tremendous vocabulary and broad knowledge of many subjects. In the last week, he's revealed a keen interest in learning more history and science. He actually typed today at school, I want to read like the 21-year-old I am. He has requested that we read history books to him while he eats his lunch. And last night, he took a college history book from his brother's room and sat paging through it at home. We are simply stunned. As his latent communication skills are emerging, his overall behavior is improving as well. He's finding new outlets, and it makes a big difference. Because there are so many components that have a role in a comprehensive autism treatment program, we have a model that helps us to uh, organize and prioritize and helps parents to participate in and to understand our approach. And so we begin by thinking about the long-term goals of recreation, social relationships, independent living and occupation. And I like to say, you know, these are goals that all of us share. And it starts with a foundation in the family and home that involves the parents, the child, siblings and other caregivers. And some of the fundamentals of, of health in the family and home have to do with nutrition, sleep quality, and overall well-being. And then we can move on to think about neurophysiology and biochemistry. And these are terms that I've used to, to capture um, what I think are the important components of treatment, uh, of physiological treatment. So within neurophysiology, electrical activity, neurotransmitter function. Within biochemistry, I include things like gastrointestinal health, uh, endocrine health, mitochondrial function, uh, immune health, and others like methylation and sulfation. And then we can move on to think about neural networks for sensory motor integration, communication, behavior, and cognition, at the same time working toward lifelong health, relational health, so health in one's relationships with other people, functional health, the ability to function in our society, psychological health, freedom from symptoms of anxiety, depression, OCD, and others, and physical health. And then we continue to uh, educate um, the individuals across the major systems of knowledge that include athletics, music, language, both spoken and written, and math. And we find very often that an, a child can be mainstreamed in school when this foundation is in place. And of course, this model is an oversimplification and all of these elements interact continuously. Um, any model of child development um, will be a simplification, but we find it's very helpful in identifying where there are gaps and uh, what to prioritize and to organize the overall approach. Um, the future direction of autism treatment I would propose can be based on a pretty simple model which is a foundation of neuroscience, integration, and community. And if we have some time, um, I have a video here that we created. One of the initiatives that we have at our center is to create what I view as an oral history of the experiences of the children and the families. And so um, this, is, this video follows the experience of, of three children and families through our program. Um, I think I'll show you just a few minutes, it's a nine, ten minute video. I'll show you just a few minutes to introduce you to the families and you could find the whole video on our website. I noticed it right away from infancy. We did not have this connection and he just did not look at me that way. Like, I'm not getting this connection, this bond, that everyone talks about, this incredible bond. And my son just was unhappy in my arms. He wouldn't refer to me as mom or anything. We uh, went through a battery of tests. It was very uh, confusing, I think. You know, they went through the, the motions of going through it, evaluating based on the, the categories that she met that the diagnosis was autism. 
the pediatrician walks in and he's like, have you done anything about his language delay? You know, he's two and a half, he doesn't have any words. And my husband's like, well, we've been asking for six months. And then he goes, he goes, well, he's delayed. Oh yeah, he's totally autistic. Literally, that was our diagnosis and sent us on our way. everything you can about it where I couldn't figure out where Lauren fit in all of this because there was I had so many questions I, I couldn't figure out where to go it wasn't so clear to me what the next steps would be all of the appointments were all over town so stressful and then making sure that all the doctors had all of the information or or the therapist had all the information is it's tough it's it literally is a whole job <laughs> on itself he went to a, um, a non-public school because in, in the public school, they just quote unquote couldn't handle him and his behaviors and him and, and, and the amount of support he needed. And they said at that point, you're non-diploma bound. And so he literally had the same goals from preschool till he was nine, the same goals. They would talk about transitions, and they would talk about job placement. And, and I cried, and I'm like, that's horrible. Basically, she required 24-7 shadowing. Somebody had to be with her around the clock. She would unpredictably go from one place to the next and not have a sense of danger. Through school, she was doing multiple therapies, and it was, it was very much, we couldn't, we couldn't crack that window. We couldn't, we couldn't reach her. I think the first time was when we had, um, actually when we started with Dr. Go, when Lauren was, had just turned six years old, we were able to see a huge difference in such a short amount of time. I remember my husband saying, she's done more in six weeks than she's done in six years. I remember going into the, our first meeting there and and that was probably the first doctor that we went to that wasn't kind of thrown back by Rowan's behavior or, you know, dismissed Rowan's behavior. It was, she, she was right on it. She just kind of gave us hope. It was the first time we kind of had hope. We have hope for a child's future and a family's future because we know the accomplishments, the abilities, the joy that is possible. And we get to see that every day. We like to use the word grounded hope. Hope for progress, hope for change, hope for stability, hope for community, hope for the growth of new and astonishing and stunning abilities for that child. The whole practice is just amazing. To in the interest of time, I think I'll pause it there. Um, and I'll just share with you our website, where you can find more information about our clinical programs, the research that supports our care model, the experiences of the families we serve, and, and about our incredible team of clinicians. So I want to thank you all, um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Go. That was really extraordinary window into your work. Does anybody have any questions? Use the mic. Oh, we can't share. It's not our Repeat the question. Um, my question is about, you know, in looking at the mitochondrial dysfunction that's going on, um, are you using targeted therapies when you're working to mm -hmm. define that? You, you showed an example with uh, yeah. the 19-year-old, yeah. or are you using more kind of global uh, mitochondrial support, CoQ10, um, you know, yeah. uh, carnitine, yeah. NAC, that kind of stuff? Yeah, so it is more, it is more global. So I would say there are probably close to two dozen different supplements that we would consider and are guided very much by testing. So, you know, CoQ10 is, is often a first-line therapy, but certainly if there's a low level of CoQ10 um, or if there's a pattern that really does point to sort of a mitochondrial respiratory chain 
defect, um, but it can include creatine, carnitine, uh, B vitamins, um, vitamin C, vitamin E, uh, D-ribose, NAC. There's a, there are a lot to select from, and often it's a process of beginning a few, checking in on the progress, and layering them in. With young children, there's the added challenge of it being very difficult to get children to take a large quantity of, of supplements. So, um, so it does vary by the individual case, but it is, um, it's a big part of what we do, and we use a wide range of nutritional supplements. And then in looking at mitochondrial dysfunction, are you working to understand the root cause underneath in terms of inflammation, oxidative stress, the sure. developmental toxicity of Landrigan that you talked about? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you, maybe if you yeah. could just give us an idea of, like, how do you begin to assess sure. that in a child with autism? Sure. So, um, and I'll say part of our, certainly our clinical protocols are guided by my own training and background. So we um, prioritize many of the neurological testing, tests, so um, uh, EEG that captures both wakefulness and sleep is a real priority. Um, the panel of metabolic tests is one that, um, that incorporates, and again, we're limited by, um, there's so much to do early on, and we are limited by things like uh, a child's ability to take supplements or by the amount of blood that we can draw. Um, so it, it often takes uh, multiple, you know, it takes many, mul many months and many series of lab tests. Um, but the protocol for mitochondrial testing that we follow is one that was developed at Kennedy Krieger Institute by Richard Kelly. Um, and that, pro that entire clinical protocol, written up in detail by Dr. Kelly, is available on our website. It's a, it's a practice parameter. And um, so we do sort of four to five hours postprandial. We'll check a full set of labs that includes... LFTs, plasma amino acids, urine organic acids, uh, CoQ10 level, um, acyl carnitine profile, and a few other labs. So that's that's pretty Is standard. Lactate. And lactate. Mm -hmm. and lactate. And lactate and pyruvate. Lactate is uh, is tricky because of the nature of the blood draw and the use of the tourniquet, and often the child is struggling at the time of the blood draw. Yeah. So interpretation of lactate is tricky. So even if it's not you know, when it's elevated, you have to take that into account. But the other, it's really a pattern of abnormalities um, that you get from the, doing the whole panel. That's helpful. Um, the, you know, the way that I think about the etiology for the, for the mitochondrial impairment is that there are so many potential contributors and usually multiple contributing factors. And um, so steps to target many of them at once often are the most effective, like lifestyle modifications and nutritional modifications, so dietary interventions. Um, so, you know, oxidative stress is, there are so many contributing factors to oxidative stress, to inflammation. Um, sometimes individuals are on uh, drugs, are on medications that have known um, adverse effects to mitochondria. And so just simply removing those is one step. Right, and um, well, risperidone, um, valproic acid, mm -hmm. are two that are very commonly used in those with autism and can have effects on mitochondrial function. Um, and it's important not to, not to forget psychosocial stressors. And especially for young children, those can include um, you know, entry into daycare, moving home, a, a change at home, uh, travel to a foreign environment, uh, the birth of a second of another child of a sibling, um, or an, a, procedure, a procedure requiring anesthesia, uh, for example, um, placement of ear tubes or correction of uh, inguinal hernia or some fairly minor procedure, which in a vulnerable period presents a stressor that can have consequences to to the function of mitochondria in an individual who already has that vulnerability. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Sure. Oh, oh. Yeah. Suzanne, uh, given the multiple factors that you're intervening with, mm -hmm. can you describe a treatment failure and what you do? Mm. And 
Mm -hmm. Whatever you're doing doesn't make a difference. Yeah. So the, the question is, um, what does it look like when the treatments that we're applying don't seem to have the benefit that we would like, where, where progress doesn't come, despite trying a whole range of, of therapies? That certainly happens. There are, uh, there are instances where the tools that we have are not, um, don't lead to the, the changes that we would like them to have. And I think that has to do with um, the fact that our tools, even the best tools that we have used in an integrated way and a thoughtful way, um, may not be enough to overcome the biological obstacle, the block that is in, impeding brain development. Um, there are um, many, for example, genetic syndromes where the molecular mechanism is known and characterized very well. It may be something like a channelopathy. Um, so the mechanism of action is understood at that detailed level, and yet we don't have the medications or other treatment modalities to, um, to target that. So there... certain uh, element or abnormality or mm -hmm. difference in the child's physiology is the thing that's making a difference if, mm -hmm. if there's nothing really that you can use to impact it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's the assumption. So that the initial, you know, the planning, the testing that we can do, the planning of treatment, um, putting in place the highest quality program that we can and getting the participation of the family and caregivers at as high a level as, as is possible, that's the starting point. And there will be a, a group of individuals that respond well and a group that don't. And for the group that don't, my sense is that it's, it may be a limitation of the tools that are available, the, the, and the limitation of the implementation. Um, and limitations in our understanding at this point in time. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yes, I was just okay. I was just wondering if you have any recommendations of uh, resources if we want to learn more about the understanding that you have. Sure. Um, so we do have. Um, there's. There is a, a blog on our website that lists out about 60 or 70 of the research articles and resources that have been influential in my learning and very much inform our care model and is organized according to topic. So there are section, you know, there's a section on epilepsy and autism and there's a section on uh, metabolism, mitochondrial function, and on all of the different domains. Um, I will say that the, the work of the developmental psychologist Marion Blank has been very influential and she has published a whole series of uh, language programs, reading programs, um, and the work of the Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs has also um, has been very informative. Thanks. Any other questions? I was wondering, um, is there specific companies for the reasons to be testing? Um, we're, I'm actually sort of in the process of deciding um, which, what company, you know, will best serve our needs. So there isn't one in particular now, but I'd be happy to talk with you maybe offline about a few that we use. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for coming Thanks. to Cleveland and enlightening <laughs> us. And uh, there's going to be a, an online interview after if anybody wants to tune into the IFM website. Um, I think it's, I don't think it's live, but I think it's uh, going to be uh, recorded, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you.